want to begin, before I begin my presentation, I want to tag a little bit off of what Nancy was saying about advocacy. Because this breakfast today is for you all here. So whatever works for you, if you want to stop me in the middle of my presentation to ask for more information, please do so. It's completely informal. But I'm here um, to provide information and also to receive information from you on, um, wow, I feel like paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it's just this fishbowl, and uh, folks aren't really paying attention to what we're doing, and we're passing uh, <coughs> passing policy that really impacts you personally and from a business perspective. And so, I would like to be the link between what happens in that building and and you all uh, in your businesses. And I love to see just the, the sort of uh, variety that we have here. We've got folks from the lab, we've got financial people, we've got uh, subcontractors. All the media is here? Wow! <laughs> Which I'm honored. <laughs> and so I just, I really appreciate you all giving up your time and, and being members of the chamber, but I want, I want it to be fruitful for you. I want that membership to work for you. Um, and so that being said, um, Nancy and I had a very brief meeting where she had actually gone in and printed up all of the legislation from the 2015 session that's available so far. It's not a lot. Because as you'll see from my timeline, we can start um, pre-filing bills on December 15th, but right now what we have are bills that have been um, endorsed by committees, by interim committees. And so those are the bills that we have. And she's off the top of her head is going, okay, this is a bill on e-cigarettes that's going to impact Gator Vapor. I mean, she's just, she knew which bills would impact which businesses in town. Um, and so she is a great resource. And I want to be a partner with her to really um, make sure that we get out information to you and that you all have access to me. Um, I have a great relationship, for example, with the school district here, with the county, and I mean, they can call me up and say, Stephanie, we need to track so-and-so bill. It's gonna be horrible for Los Alamos public schools if that gets out, and so we, you know, we work together on, on that type of thing. So I would love to do the same with our local business owners because, um, you know, we campaign on, on y'all all the time and say you're the backbone of a strong economy. I mean, I want to, put my money where my mouth is really and, and help you out as much as I can. I know it's not easy to do what you do. It takes a crazy person. Just like it takes a crazy person to do what I do, it takes a crazy person to, to start your business. And you guys are really my hats off to you. I'm sorry, that was probably your own story. I apologize. If, if you don't think crazy is a good thing, I think it's a good thing. Um, I do have my cards if you want to have my uh, contact information. I've got copies of bills that uh, Nancy passed out. I will talk briefly about them. Um, but if you'd like to see more, I, I have copies of the bills here. I, we actually have paper copies. Um, so I'm going to start on sort of my perspective. <clears throat> like I said, interrupt me any time. But then I want to have some time at the end if, if there are things that have come up for you that you'd like to see the state um, face. If there are things you've heard that are coming down the pipe that you're concerned about or happy about, um, I want to hear that as well. So without further ado, here is my presentation on the legislative preview. So this upcoming session starts uh, the Tuesday after Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And it's a long session, so everything with the kitchen sink. Everything. Um, it's in, in, uh, you know, in, in uh, contrast to the short session, we can only do budget, budgetary issues, and anything on the governor's call is everything. So these are just the set of the dates to be aware of. And at the end of my presentation, I'm going to show you the legislative website, because it actually is a trove of information and great way to track bills and bill progress. But December 15th, we can start dropping legislation and that legislation will actually appear on the website. So if there's anything that you know is coming down the pipe, you may see it as early as December 15th. Opening day is the 20th, deadline for us to introduce legislation. So if you're thinking about something in the back of your mind, I'd like Stephanie to carry this, you need to talk to me before February 8th. Uh, we end on the 21st. April 10th is the pocket veto um, deadline, so every, anything that the governor has not signed by that time is automatically vetoed. And 19th is when the legislation and the appropriations especially go into effect. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna start where Nancy left off with this great news that yes, there were some troubling times in the, in the, um, the uh, National Defense Authorization Act 
But in the end, um, it did pass the Senate with the Manhattan Project Park in it, which is going to be a huge impact for us and our area. Uh, Nancy was thinking probably three to five years after the park is established, we will really see the effects of that. So we want to leverage as much of that as possible because it is increased uh, foot traffic, tourism, and clientele to this area. So that's important for us here in, in uh, Los Alamos. Um, and I don't know if you know the details about the, the park, but it's going to have three different sites, Oak Ridge, Hanford, and us. Um, I actually want to brag a little bit about this uh, memorial. It was a joint memorial that passed unanimously through the House and Senate in the state, at the state level, to sort of give a message to Congress um, New Mexico supports the establishment of this park. And it was important to me um, because always I, I try to work on um, the relationship Los Alamos has with the rest of the state. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not always the best relationship, if I'm being quite honest. We have just a lot of history that's um, impacted that relationship. Los Alamos has not always needed the state, really relied on the state, because we have this federal institution here, and, and so we pay sometimes more attention to what happens at the federal level. But I sort of made it one of my personal missions to really try to uh, improve the relationship between Los Alamos and the, and the state, and especially our, some of our local um, state electeds that, that are just you know, right in this area. Um, I'm, I'm really working on that. So that, that memorial just sort of support the park. Um, you know, it was a little bit of a gesture, but I, I felt that it was an important one, and it did pass unanimously, so that was, that was good. Um, because you would be surprised how um, controversial it is sometimes, even just to say Manhattan Project National Park. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so this goes sort of along with my speech on advocacy. New Mexico, since I've been elected, has really tried to make it its mission. I'm talking about state government, in particular the legislature, but also <coughs> the governor's uh, office. We want to change the climate for doing business in New Mexico. That is a goal. And we started that um, with some of these things, and I can talk about them, and I've talked about them before. Um, I just want to make sure that you really understand that even though it seems like we put up barriers and we make it harder to do business, there is that um, desire to make doing business in New Mexico easier and better, more effective, more efficient. So if you have ideas for how to do that, we should talk. What we've done so far is we have the tax package bill. Um, it's been talked about ad nauseum, but it, it came through the 2013 session, the very last end of the session, passed the Senate almost unanimously, uh, there's a lot of controversy over it in the House, but basically what it did is it provided a single sales factor um, so that folks can either choose to report their out-of-state sales or their in-state sales. It lowered the corporate income tax level. Um, this is something that I, I campaigned on. Um, it, it implemented combined reporting for big box stores, so now that small businesses are more competitive with big box stores. And it established this, well, this is other legislation. I talked to you before about the one-stop portal, that any kind of licensing issues that you have at the state level, I'd love to see this done at the county level at some point, but any licensing regulatory issues you have done at the state level, we are trying to combine into one online place. So what this will require is a bunch of different agencies to work together. And right now it's still being implemented, but its intent is to be online, and one place to do all of your signing up for whatever business licenses you need, all of it, right there. Um, because I've, we've heard that that is one of the impediments of, of starting up a business, is that you gotta go here and there, and then you didn't have that paper you needed, so you gotta go back, and um, we want to make it that as streamlined as possible. So that is currently being implemented. What that, all of these things did, is that we are now considered um, our manufacturing rate is now the best in the region for manufacturing. We've been given this Outstanding Achievement Award in, tax, in state tax reform by a nonpartisan tax foundation. And there was an Ernst & Young study uh, that showed we've dropped tax rates by manufacturing by the 60%, the greatest drop in the western states. So in the western region, we really have one of the most robust um, 
reform efforts. And we're still in the midst of that. And I realize a lot of this does impact manufacturing. But my message to you today is that it's about business. We want to be business friendly in New Mexico. And this is our, our way of sort of getting our foot in the door and moving in that direction. Okay, along with that um, was this issue of employment in New Mexico that was abysmal. We have not seen employment numbers grow really significantly since 08, since the bottom went out of our economy. So the legislature put together this jobs council. This jobs council is not permanent. It was an ad hoc council that met for one year. We decided to meet, go ahead and meet for another year. It was a two year council and, and it was a really in-depth economic study of what it would take, which sectors we should focus on, which industries we should focus on, what would it take to really grow jobs here. And we spent two years doing that. And these are some of the pieces that came out of that Jobs Council work. And I just want to tell you, the Jobs Council was phenomenal. We had folks from the governor's office, that, so it wasn't just legislators, it was a legislative committee. But we had folks from the governor's office, so her department of, um, Economic Development, the, the Secretary of that department sat on this Jobs Council. We had Labor on this Jobs Council. We had the Chamber of Commerce, the Spider Chamber of Commerce sat. So it was all different players in the business realm sitting together. <coughs> and, and there was um, one of our, our standards, our standards of excellence, was that we, everything that met this list had to be passed unanimously. One member on that council could veto any piece on our final proposal to the legislature. So it was kind of a, you know, I mean, it was really a meeting of minds of, of various folks from, from different walks of life really coming together to say, what's best? What can we measure? What can we really target and focus and invest in? And so this is the result of all of that work. Um, we want to fund the New Mexico Partnership for a significant increase. Basically, they are the state's recruiters for new business. Um, they are not state run, but they are partially state funded. We want to increase, and I'll talk about LIDA in a minute because that's something that's near and dear to my heart, but we're going to establish this closing fund to help um, <clears throat> in those business deals when you need just that little bit of the incentive to, to um, book the deal, and, and my economic development professional would like, yes, I know exactly what you mean. Um, this, this type of thing is, is something that um, we found states doing all around us and we were not doing it. Yes, sir? Is that something where local communities can access that or is that fund going to be administered by the state? It's, it's going to be administered by the state. So it does say LIDA. It does say LIDA there. And that is the mechanism that we are using, um, but it will be administered through EDD. And so LIDA itself can, can is... Can a local community approach the state and say, we would like to request that the state put half a million dollars from that fund into this project we're working on? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the JTEC program is a jobs training program that has just proven to be the most effective thing we do. Basically, if you have a high wage job and you need to do implant training for that job, we provide an incentive for that training. So that's good for high, high paying jobs. Um, this co-op advertising is with the Department of Tourism. And so there are these agreements that we have around the state uh, between the, the New Mexico Department of Tourism and the local uh, folks to, to get the message out and, and they sort of help with that marketing effort. And that's what the co-op is. And the Economic Development Grant Fund um, is mostly for, and, and I talked before about the economic development professionals that are in the room, but this is mostly to, to fund staff because we just don't have enough closers. We don't have enough people on the ground closing deals uh, in New Mexico to, to make it worth our while. So this is to leave that effort up. Um, so the, it, a lot of it sounds like it's not going to impact you all. It's attracting folks from, from outside to, to relocate here. And a lot of the, the focus is on that. But I can talk to you a little bit about VIA because that is something that could potentially impact you all and something that I'm going to be working on in the upcoming session. So any questions on this list? Yeah. Just one, yeah. One clarification. These are recommendations. To These are recommendations. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. These are recommendations that passed Jobs Council unanimously. They unanimously came out of Jobs Council, and I would just say that 
the future speaker, speaker-elect, actually sat on that council, so he does have buy-in into this. He sat on the Appropriations Committee, so he understands state budgets. Um, so the, that bodes well for this list. So this is now has to be considered by House Appropriations, Senate Finance, yes, yes. Will this be something that's in House Bill 2, the Appropriations Bill, or? Um, I don't think that it will be. I think it's okay. gonna be a standalone. Okay. Um, the thing is, the first three, Eric, the first four actually have been endorsed by the Governor's Economic Development um, Department. So that also goes well for those, okay? So that's, this is a significant investment in job, in job creation, actually. It, this is nothing to sneeze at. It's not as sexy as some other things, but it's significant. <laughs> Stephanie, can I just Go add? Ahead. And, um, <laughs> I happened to get the chance to participate in the, one of the exercises of the Jobs Council you know, that we did at the local level on the jobs. And I was really impressed by the fact that what this, what they're aiming at is what they're talking about is core jobs, meaning they're companies who are selling and the money is coming from outside the state. Okay. In other words, they're not bringing in people, national restaurant chains to replace local businesses. They're bringing in um, businesses whose funding comes from <coughs> elsewhere that will then products. create right. three more jobs right. in the right. local communities right. For the you know the, the employees the staff that they employ would then be served by the local businesses here. Okay, this is a very that's important a point, point that I did not mention, and that's another economic development professional. So of course he's thinking that way. But basically, one of the tenets of anything the Jobs Council did, so it had to be metric based. We had to be able to 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 uh, measure what the what the success was. If if we were going to uh, invest in it, how would we know if we're successful? But another tenet was that we had to create economic-based jobs only. And what economic-based jobs are is what Greg just described. They're not just recycling the workforce and the jobs that we already have. They actually had to bring from outside or sell products to folks from outside. So we're bringing in new dollars. They have to bring in new dollars. They can't just be a reshuffle of, what we are, of what's already existing. So absolutely. And uh, Greg mentioned that he took part in an exercise that he did with Jobs Council. Jobs Council um, spurred, I guess, they didn't run, but they spurred these regional discussions all over the state, talking in, in particular for that region, what is our industry, what is our sector that we want to grow, that we can provide, what, what's the workforce, what, what is it that we sort of specialize in? And so they did this whole, um, sort of analysis, um, regional analysis of their regional economy. And all of those regional analyses were put together into the state version. And so really this is, um, it's a lot of work. We had some great folks working with us that you know kind of kept us on track, at, uh, economists working with us. And it, it's, it's in depth, it's thorough, it's relevant. It's relevant to the state. It's not just something that some guy went in and said, I want to do a bill, I'm going to give a million dollars to the partnership. I mean, that money represents something. Um, so, just, just one thought on this story. Uh, small <coughs> business doesn't have much time to pay attention to what's going on, so all of yeah. this is new to yeah. this particular yeah. small yeah. business. Uh, but I think there's a, uh, an element here that, uh, that you might try to take advantage of, and that is its newness and its relatively unknownness. Uh, and get the word out across the state that this thing's cooking. Yeah. Uh, I, I watched New Mexico and Focus on gentlemen. Okay, right, Channel 5. I've yes. never heard them mention this. Jobs Council. Maybe, maybe yeah. I missed that yeah. issue. I don't know the Jobs Council's ever been on Canada. Yeah, they always talk about problems and, and low ranking and so on and so forth, but I've never heard any conversation at all about uh, what's on the horizon with this. And so it would be, I think, useful for passage. Uh, to get that word out right. somehow. And, and to constituents and small business owners so that yeah. they maybe can talk to their legislators about how important this package is going to yeah. be. Yeah. This is going to be an important package. I didn't, so this is a longer list. I gave you the top five, but some other smaller appropriations have to do with workforce development. Huge, right? I mean, we really saw that as an, a real issue. And I know some of you who employ people um, know that we have this issue of, of sort of a um, anemic workforce. I don't really know the, the I'm an educator, so it's, it's 
hard for me to say anything negative, but um, you know, we have an issue with our with the qualified workforce. I'll just say that. Um, so so that type of thing, what else do they force? Huh? Force restoration. Oh, we have a project on forest restoration because we have this whole issue where that industry is gone, right, for 50 years now, the logging industry, and, and so we have that, the, the dirt of that issue, of that industry, but now we have these over, overgrown forests, and so dealing with, with that on, a, on an economic development level um, is important. So we've got a forest restoration program. Oh, solo work. We really are targeting our solo work people. So folks like you, okay, that, um, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a, um, a storefront. You may do business all over the nation, but you're based out of New Mexico. And we really want to support those folks as much as possible because in our analyses, the solo work workforce and solo work industry, no matter what they do, um, is really a potential, a growth potential for New Mexico. So as long as we can, and so like broadband is very important for solo workers. Um, <coughs> type of thing. So yeah, solo work. Yes. I just want to add that um, Los Alamos does take advantage of the co-op marketing. Oh, uh, good to hear. Absolutely. Okay. We've maxed out okay. what we can do. Excellent. With the co -op. I, I, I should have known. I should have known. Okay, so the things that I am going to be working on personally, some of them impact you all, but I just wanted to let you know what my fo focuses are. My DUI legislation that I always carry, I'm going to bring it back again. Um, it's to close some of the loopholes in our current laws on interlock. <laughs> Class size limits is something that I'm completely passionate about. You know I am a school teacher. Um, I have experiential evidence on the importance of small class sizes. Some other education reform issues that have come up over the last two years in our sort of um, attempts to reform education but maybe need to be tweaked. I'm working on that actually with the Republican Party. Uh, procurement reform to make sure that our uh, in-state owned businesses are competitive when they go for state contracts. We have a lot of issues with our procurement process at the state level. So some of you in here might have experience with procurement at the national level. Uh, at the state level, we have some issues as well. And because I represent so many subcontractors to LANL, those contractor issues are really near and dear to my heart. Um, those are people, you know, those are my constituents. And so I, I really want to do what I can for this procurement. Uh, changes to LIDA. So LIDA stands for Local Economic Development Act. And it is um, sort of a revolutionary program that we do at the state. And basically, uh, there are a number of different things that it does, but I want to talk about one in particular, and that is money available to retail specifically. Um, what happened when s some of the money was earmarked for retail is that folks didn't want everybody to be able to use it. We don't want Albuquerque to necessarily raid this fund um, because we want to focus on some of the smaller communities. And so what they did is they put in a 10,000 person, 10, person population limit. Like you could only take advantage of this money for retail. Improvements, uh, what, I mean, you've been working on it, Dave. What else is, can this money be used for? I actually have not. Okay. And so so LIDA money can, be, can specifically be used for um, the acquisition of property, the acquisition of uh, equipment, um, it, it's typically not been used for operating costs. Right. If you want to right. buy a building, build a building. Or improvements to your building. Improve your building, um, and buy important pieces of equipment, that type of thing. Curb appeal, um, like correct. signage, that kind of thing. <clears throat> right. So there is some money set aside for retail to be able to do that. But it was limited, it is, it is currently limited to towns with populations under 10,000. I'm actually working with um, Councilor Israel events. We're hoping to put forth a bill that will raise that bar, um, and we're thinking to 20,000, so that we can take advantage of that here in Los Alamos. It would really be a game changer for us. Um, and so that's a big, I don't know that we'll be able to get it through on our first try. Uh, we're still sort of, Oh, you just have such a cynical look on your face, Patrick. No, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm as supportive of that as anyone could ever be. Um, so whatever we can do to, to help you do that. So there, there was, a gap here. well, there was a, a compromise that was struck in the original legislation so that they could have money set aside for retail. Um, they did put that cap on it. So all we're asking is just up the cap, just 
just a little bit. And possibly we could you know, really garner support of other legislators that represent communities of that size. I mean, it's not a large increase in the number of communities. It's not a large so increase in the number of communities. In fact, I've done legislation similar on a completely different note, but, but raising a cap. And it's interesting to look at population sizes in New Mexico because um, we're in a small pool with, with the, the size that we have. I mean, they're, you know, they're teeny tinies, and then they're, of course, the metropolises, and then we're, we're in a fairly small pool. <coughs> um, campaign finance reform. So I've been approached by a group who wants to um, really get a handle on money in, in politics. And you all had to live through this last election. I had to live through this last election. Um, that kind of thing is right up my alley. So I will be working on that. Um, we'll see how that comes out. Omari's Law is something on um, trying to change some of the requirements around um, CYFD and uh, abuse and neglected children. Uh, STEM initiatives is always something that's near and dear to me, you know, working on uh, ideas around uh, especially education for, for STEM areas. And I don't know, my husband told me to put possible land legislation. I'm supposed to have a meeting with Lionel people. <laughs> um, so I don't know what's coming. <coughs> That's and then, of course, uh, I represent an area that has many acequias, probably more than a dozen, maybe even two dozen acequias. Many small future domestic water uh, programs. So, you know, people that live in Hamas and Cuba. They have their own water association. And they pay a fee into that water association. They don't have the utilities. They don't have, and, and those systems um, are reaching kind of a critical point. And so there is an effort to rewrite the regional water plans around the state, taking into account drought, taking into account supply, taking into account um, development, all of those things. And there are some issues that I see with local voice in the rewriting of those regional water plans. Because I represent um, a lot of small communities, and I want to make sure that, that their voice is heard in those regional water plans. So this doesn't impact you specifically. The lead up really is probably the one that will impact you really specifically uh, on your bottom line. But you know, I, I want you to be aware of what your state representative is championing. So I, I wanted to get my list. Any questions on these? On the water, water issue yes. and reforestation issue, yes. uh, can the uh, uh, New Mexico uh, uh, Nature Conservancy, okay. uh, are they a logical partner? You know, I don't children? know that they've been a partner. Because um, they've got a major water issue uh, 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 or uh, initiative uh, to help um, um, capture the water before it gets to the okay. river. Okay. And that's statewide. They're focused on the Gila right now, but uh, they care about the entire uh, uh, Rio Grande. Okay. And, uh, and, and so, as it turns out, they've got a fund that you know, anybody can contribute to. Uh, that's just to indicate how involved they are in this particular issue. Uh, so there, there may be a possible partnership. Partnership. Well, I'll tell you something interesting that I found. Work. These regional water plans were written early 2000s maybe, they haven't been rewritten since then, but we've gone through, I mean, we have so many issues since they were written. Conservation was not included in the original water plans. There was no conservation aspect. So that's, I mean, that's something that, you know, I'm really looking to, to uh, include in the rewriting of these plans, is that this <coughs> issue of conservation and, and how it plays into supply and demand of water resources. It's so, worth making contact yeah, with Yeah, absolutely, yeah. thank you for that. You wouldn't believe how many little ideas I get from, or from groups like this. Okay, so this is legislation that we know exists and is out there. <clears throat> I've got the full bills here, but basically what we did is um, we're giving little blurbs on things that we think might impact you all. Changes to the liquor license application requirements. So there are no restaurant owners. Victor didn't come. There are no restaurant owners here. Um, this mostly has to do with our small but growing uh, craft brew, craft wine, craft distillery community and industry in New Mexico, which is moving and shaping. 
And because I like my roux, I'm happy about that too. <laughs> but um, really, they're doing a great job and have been extremely successful. So they put together a package, and most of the changes in that package have to do impact them and their ability to be competitive um, and sell out of state and things like that. I mean, we're talking economic base, right? Economic base. We want to bring in dollars. We don't want to recycle dollars. Um, so, but there are some changes to, um, just to be aware of, you know folks that own restaurants that might be looking at a liquor, liquor license, there are some changes proposed in the legislation to change um, reporting requirements. Like, so if you saw Victor when he was getting his liquor license had to post um, about the, the public meeting that was gonna be uh, held at, at county council and he had to do that in a certain amount of time before uh, the, the meeting took place, and so there's some change, proposed changes to that. So that's something to just kind of keep in the back of your mind. There is a pilot project now. This is just a pilot project. I believe it was a $500,000 appropriation, huh? $900,000 appropriation for supported housing, so Section 8 housing. So if you know any property folks, um, this pilot probably will not take place here in Los Alamos, but um, it is a proposed appropriation to start a pilot for, for Section 8 housing for, for that type of this is interesting. Uh, we're looking at these, the e-cigarettes. So you know we have our Tobacco Tax Act, where we tax tobacco in the state, uh, we use those taxes for tobacco cessation. I know, it's bizarre. Uh, but we're adding now this electronic, so it's called tobacco clocks. So we do have Bayer Gaper, ga Vapor, Gator Vapor, um, who actually is not a chamber member. So that might be something, some interesting conversation um, that you have, whoever meet folks that aren't chamber members, just to talk to them about the benefits of being here today, of having a relationship with Nancy, having a relationship with Patrick. Um, you know, that really is, that's a real thing um, for people's bottom line. So these two, uh, last proposals came from the Tobacco Settlement Fund uh, um, interim committee, and they are to add vaping and e-cigarettes to all of these, so to the tax and to the, um, to the tobacco, you know, uh, below 18, you can't purchase tobacco, but the prohibition of tobacco for under 18. So yes. right now yes. kids can buy the e-cigarettes? Yes, right now kids can buy the Yes, in New Mexico. Yeah. We don't have a prohibition. Uh, any questions about these? So I've got the larger bills here if you want to look at them, especially <coughs> this one about the, the if anyone's interested in, in the uh, craft brewery, they've really been working. Um, they've got some good, good proposals for what they'd like to, to see for their industry. <coughs> yes? Um, just revenue, income. Revenue. Uh, how close to crystal ball looking at? It's not looking that great. Yeah. So it was earlier on. It was earlier on. We got we got a revenue forecast in the in the summer, and I think it was two hundred and forty million something like that around there of ex, of of extra money. Extra money. Um, but now I'm hearing like these dire like oil prices are low and our minimum leases are down and that. So who's heard of? Have you heard a new estimate? Anybody? So it's like two forty five this summer. I've heard down to at least 100 million less as the upper end, and maybe even below 100 million. Yeah. So it's not looking good. It was, and now it's not. Yeah. Okay. okay, so here is the website. The reason I wanted to point this out, and I don't know if this has a point on it. Ooh, look at that. Okay, so it's nlegis.gov. And if you just Google the Mexico legislature, this will come up. These are the things to pay attention to. Legislation here, you can do a search by bill number, if you know the bill number, or keyword. You can type in any keyword you're interested in. So if there is a bill that you're chasing, this will show you its progress through committee, whether it has, it's died, its progress, you know, it has the four votes. If you'd like me to track something for you, please uh, contact me and via email because the, there are things that I pay attention to for constituents. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk to you about is this side has session dates, and there's just a whole bunch of information about, like I gave you the, the sort of timeline at the beginning, like I said, if there's stuff that you want me to carry, 
I need to drop it before a certain date. And so we need to have a conversation about drafts and things like that beforehand. Um, I carry legislation for constituents all the time. The, the mayor of Hamas Springs and I had a great partnership. I mean, that guy, I don't know who taught him to do what he did. He's a professor out of California. But he contacted me, told me what he wanted me to do. Uh, the Municipal League actually helped us out with our draft. And we were able to pass a law together. So it's, I mean, that's the, that's the, the beauty of the citizen legislature is that we're very accessible. Um, Nancy, anything you can think of upcoming legislative meetings uh, will have the committees. So you can look for committee, uh, uh, the agendas. But it is a hurry up and wait game. Who said that? Did you say that, Dave? Yeah, so just because it says a committee meets at a certain time, you don't necessarily meet at that time. It depends on when the fourth session gets out, I mean, all kinds of things. So um, if you go up for a, to hear a hearing on a certain bill or to testify for a certain bill, it's great to hear from local business owners. Um, know that you have to kind of put it into the long haul. Who's been, you've been to the legislature. If you're a newbie, you might want to go with an old hand. <laughs> so they can show you around, but also so that you know that, you know, it's, you feel like an idiot just waiting there and waiting there and waiting there, but that's really how it is. I mean, and people, we're lucky. It's just right down the road from us. People come from, you know, Hobbs and Carlsbad and Silver City to testify at the legislature. And boy, I feel bad for them when they, you know, they're here and gets bumped to the next day. They've got to stay in town. It's, we have it lucky. So any questions on the site? Um, there's contact information for all the legislators on this site. I don't have internet, so I'm not going to click on anything, but it's just a screenshot. So there it is. And it looks like that. All right. So what would you all like to say to me? New Mexico 126. Yes. <laughs> so we can talk a little bit about this is Dave's pet project. We're going to call it the Fox Highway. Even more so with the $100 million shortfall. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's uncertain. It's uncertain, but it's it's moving forward. So what uh, Mr. Fox is talking about is the road from here, actually, through the Hamas, over the Hamas mountain range into Cuba. So it goes uh, by Fenton Lake, goes that area. And basically, if you've ever driven that road, unless you've got a pretty robust vehicle, or you're not driving in the spring or the winter or you know any time like that, um, it's, it wasn't paved. And so that was a really sort of iffy way to get to Cuba. There was a proposal actually a few years back by DOT to start paving it from both ends and meet in the middle. And it's an exciting proposition because it connects us to all of that population and, tra and uh, traffic. Four corners. The Four Corners traffic, basically, the Four Corners population. Um, and so it really could impact business. Right. Um, it's run into a few snags. So one of the snags has been just money and priority. It's not, you know, we've got so many road issues in New Mexico. Paving a brand new one comes to the bottom. Um, and then it ran into issues with landowners. Uh, there are a lot of landowners on the other side. So not necessarily coming from this side, but on the other side near Cuba, we've got like lease allotments and, and centuries owned, you know, ancestral property that comes right up to the proposed road. And DOT was in negotiation with those landowners, you know, this is our proposed route, there was a lot of back and forth, and then that all kind of fell apart. Those folks are my constituents. And I've been working with them somewhat to try to get the conversation restarted. Um, I do believe that they were, um, probably not treated fairly by DOT. Um, I've, I've heard stories about it. I haven't actually heard from DOT myself, but um, it doesn't sound great. So I have committed to working, there's a group, sort of a ad hoc <coughs> volunteer group in town that really wants to look at um, putting our, our energy and our resources behind making sure that that 126 paving happens. Um, and so, you know. I think one way to light up the uh, division is, I don't, I don't know how many visitors there are in a given tourist season <coughs> in the Four Corners regions, but it's gotta be at least a million. Yeah. I'm sure it's more than that. And 5% of those people found their way down this new highway, right smack into the middle of the Hamas pile instead of routing their money around either 
And think about that geographically, what that would mean. I mean, yeah. really. It's a direct we, shot into Santa Fe, for example, so it's yeah. got a lot to say for it uh, in terms of its attractiveness to people who are up in that region, as long as they know about it. Uh, what this road can mean to them in terms of a great uh, vacation experience. 5% um, of the 1 million just right. spending $20 it's a, a piece. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful set of metrics it's, to show you. a lot of money. Absolutely, absolutely, it's impactful. It really what do you is. estimate the time would be to get from here to Cuba if the road On the road, on paid road? If the road were finished, it took two and a half hours uh, when I drove it the uh, first of October, I guess it was. So what do you think air conditioning? Uh, but uh, and and I was surprised. Just, I didn't know that it was being worked on at all. By the way, I learned from Rob, the marketing guy for the Valles, that it has already been designated a national historic scenic byway. Oh, yeah. oh, so very good. That's a big one. And, and Manhattan Project and all of this stuff that works. All together. fits in together. Yes, yeah. it does. And so. I forgot the question. Just if that, once it's paved, what's the time to get? Well, I don't know because uh, in its current condition, and which is much better than I remember from 20 years ago, uh, there is a bat was in the first of August a stretch from uh, the fish hatchery up to where you get to a, kind of a, a really dense basalt canyon. It's short walls, but it's dense and a, and a real problem. Uh, unless you got the right stuff. <laughs> I think from back to Cuba is 64 miles. Well, to so if you were paved, so for paved, you'd be a little be, over now. Yeah. yeah, an hour and 15 to an hour and a half. Thanks, Bill. And whereas now to get to Cuba is just two, two hours, hours <laughs> and 20 minutes or something. That's my district, just remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it includes the San Pedro wilderness, which is a right. Gordon the Valle, I mean, everything yeah. in there, all, yeah. all of that um, right. is, is such a great boon. The linkage at this end is kind yeah. of hurting because of New Mexico 4 and the hurricane turn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could lead to bicycling. And but we're actually talking about New Mexico 4 as well um, in stages. Yeah. yeah. So um, that work is, is being done. And, and there are people who have just volunteered. I mean, Dave sort of spurred a little group together to start talking about these issues and meeting, and so. It's it all because of the Christmas season and, and the election. Uh, but uh, it needs to get going again, and, and a group needs to be put together that yeah. can adopt first steps. Yeah, and, and advocate, and, yeah. and right. possibly even um, try to <coughs> spur some um, participation from Havis folks, yeah. Cuba folks. I mean, all. Yeah. It needs to be knit together. Yeah. Yeah. So a regional and, and, and not become a Los Alamos right. at right. all. Right. Because it really impacts us, the whole Hamas region. Yeah. Yes, Patrick. So the, the Jobs Council recommendation, that in, in my 12 years here, that's the most comprehensive and impressive economic development package I've ever seen. Yay! Um, so what's, what's the best way for, for us to know how to support that and who are the key legislators that need to be contacted? That's um, a great question. You know, and the same thing with the Lita. That's the a great group. question. It's going to be all those folks on House of Probes and Senate Finance. Okay. All those people. And one of them is our uh, senator, one of our senators, well, if you live in White Rock, um, is Carlos Cicero, who sits on Senate Finance. I, I did have a position on House Appropriations. I don't know what the committee assignments are for the upcoming um, sessions, so I, until I know those, I don't know what my participation in the process okay. would be, but um, you know, I'm definitely going to be working on talking with people about the importance of that. And actually, a good strategy for those of you who are economic development professionals is to get that word out to your colleagues so they can talk to their small business owners in their communities, because that's who legislators need to hear from. Okay. This will impact us. This will impact us personally. This will impact the bottom line. This will impact economic development. So I think legislators should hear and maybe even have testify, a testimony from small business owners saying, in particular, this is how this will impact you. I guess that was the second question. What is the most impactful way of, of showing support? Is it calling, writing an email, actually testifying during I wouldn't the say email. I, I, I think showing up in person, trying to get a couple minutes in a corner with your legislator. Um, I don't know. I mean, how do you guys do it? And you're a big lobbyer too, Dave. So, I mean, you talk about how you talk with these folks. But for I'll tell you, for me, actually seeing that someone made the effort to come down there, right. 
is important, and it just takes a, a couple minutes to have like a, a statement to say, this money changes my life this way, sort of like that. Um, and so I don't know if we can help talk about language that, that will get through to people, but really starting to spread the word to, to people throughout the state, and especially people who represent folks that sit on those two committees. Those two committees are important. And talking about the fact that the governor has basically already given her stamp of approval to those first four recommendations. Okay. Will those four be in, in a single bill together, or will they? So how do we, last time we tried to do it independently. We, we okay. did it independently last time, and it just sort of, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, they're talking about a package. They're talking about an actual, they're calling it a jobs package, because actually that even message is better. Right. You know, like the tax package we had before. This could be the jobs package. Um, so I think it's probably going to be all together, but talk about specifics. That, that lead money or that, you know, whatever it is, um, and the importance. Because you, especially you guys that work in economic development, I mean, you, that's your world. You can speak about that. But to give words, help small business owners talk about how it will help them uh, is important. Yes, Bill. Uh, one thing, there is going to be legislation carried by Senator Lavelle, who carried it last year, and it's also going to be uh, uh, co-sponsored by Senator Campos, uh, so it'll be bipartisan in the Senate, on for support uh, for training in helping organizations across the state in improving their uh, practices. So this is related to quality in New Mexico. Okay, so how will okay. be the organization that will wind up uh, getting the money will be through uh, probably uh, also Workforce Solutions, so Selena Secretary Bussey. And that uh, is, that legislation I know is going to be moving, but I don't think there's anyone that we have lined up in the On house. house side. Okay. So okay. if you're interested, I think it would be good to get, again, bipartisan support. Oh, I'm going to you know, the governor has been very supportive of those initiatives and in the past. And again, uh, Secretary Bussey has been very supportive. So I think that's something. And the reason why I mention it is in the last round on the New Mexico Performance Excellence Awards, you know, we had nine uh, organizations recognized. Of those nine, four were from Los Alamos, the, the schools, the, um, the Public Utilities Department, which actually got a higher level award, and then also two organizations in the laboratory. Very good. So four out of nine is four. I, I would love to either care, do it myself when it comes over to the House yeah. side or um, help identify someone who would be good. Um, and, okay. you know, yeah, absolutely. Yes, Ted. <laughs> Stephanie, two questions and a request. Uh, uh, excuse me, two thank yous and a request. Uh, first, thank you uh, for your support of higher education in this state. Um, UNM Los Alamos has been beneficiary of a lot of legislation in higher education and you've been very supportive of higher education, so thank you for that. The other thank you is for your support of business advocacy for small business development statewide for my colleagues that are in Las Vegas or in Taos or in Carlsbad or Roswell or Silver City who are off the, the, the I mean, Rio Grande Corridor. The Rio Grande Corridor. Small business development is, is their only world um, when it comes to business development and for your business advocacy, small business advocacy uh, and the small business development centers and their continued funding, thank you. Request. Uh, this morning's uh, New Mexican speaks about federal funds lifting Los Alamos while the rest of New Mexico struggles, uh, which is a very, very interesting article. And But one of the interesting things that the article mentions, which speaks to something you said earlier, and that's your education advocacy. Jeff Peach, who's an econo economist at New Mexico State University. So he helped the Job Council, just so you know. He's phenomenal. He says that the key to the challenge that New Mexico has is workforce training, workforce development, uh, and education. Um, and whatever the Small Business Development Center, whatever UNM Los Alamos can do, 
um, and whatever we can do regionally here in northern New Mexico to assist you in legislation for education and workforce training. Uh, because one of the criticisms is that um, when it, Bachelor of Arts degrees that, that our population um, falls uh, behind that compared to other states around us. So uh, that's the request. So I actually glossed over STEM and you know all of everything that I, I'm trying to champion for education, but actually vocation, vocational and working with um, our <coughs> two-year colleges uh, is really something that is something I'm behind. I, I've met with Randy Grissom, I've met with um, Kathy Winograd down at CNM to see their operations. I mean, these places are, they can change on a dime. They can, they can build up a program very quickly um, and, and just sort of shift resources because they don't sort of have, they're not the bulwark of the, of the main campuses. And so I think really trying to leverage, I mean, I would love to see a model uh, that Tennessee went to where they basically have said, so like our lottery money that we give to, for the scholarships, they basically use money like that to fund 14-year um, education for their kids. So they, they do the first 12 and then two years of, a, of any community college or, or two year that, that kids want to go to. So they will fund that first 14 years. Um, it'd be great for us to get behind something like that because uh, our community colleges and our two years, I think, are really the key to workforce training um, and, and developing those kinds of programs, vocational programs and that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, if, if you ever get a chance to visit the greenhouse, at Santa Fe Community College, they've got hydroponics and aquaponics. And if you don't know the difference, you need to go visit them. It's growing, growing uh, plants in water with fish underneath, and then growing plants in water with, without. But it's, wow, really neat things and, and revolutionary things happening at Santa Fe Community College. I've talked too long. But there are no more hands, Nancy. See? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. but I hope to, to get the word out of those. So like the, the um, I'll do one at the Senior Center, I've done one here, um, so keep your eye out for those. And please contact me, my information's here, I'm gonna leave my card. <laughs>